Hi, I'm Alex and welcome to Super Make Something Basics. Today, we're repairing a broken keyboard. To fix your keyboard, you must first break your keyboard. For the last two years or so, I've owned a Logitech K400 Bluetooth keyboard with an integrated trackpad. The K400 is the perfect keyboard for setting up a Raspberry Pi, since it combines both a keyboard and mouse while supplying its own power off of two AA batteries. As an added bonus, the wireless functionality also makes it great for surfing the internet from my couch using an old computer connected to my TV. Unfortunately, the keyboard recently had an unintentional encounter with a beverage, which caused the O key to stop working. As it turns out, a lot of websites have an O somewhere in the URL, which makes browsing the internet or doing anything else useful on the computer very difficult. While I could have bought a replacement online for about $25, I felt a bit guilty about throwing away an otherwise perfectly functional keyboard. As such, I figured that since it was already broken anyway, I might as well crack it open and try to repair it, which, in the worst case, would at least allow me to learn more about how this piece of tech works. So how does a keyboard work? The vast majority of keyboards in use today work by mechanically completing a circuit when a key is pressed. This triggers a voltage change, which is sensed by an integrated circuit inside the keyboard that then generates a key command and sends it to a computer. A variety of different mechanical actuation technologies exist, from heavy-duty mechanical switches to one-piece rubber domes that sit beneath each key, but all of these types of keyboards make use of a specially designed set of gridded circuits known as a key matrix. Since keyboards have a lot of buttons, it's impractical to have a dedicated sense line for each key. As a result, the key matrix is designed in such a way that button presses result in a specific combination of two integrated circuit pins changing voltage at the same time, each of which then maps to a specific keyboard key. This greatly cuts down on the number of required sensing lines, which makes a keyboard's integrated circuits less complicated and ultimately lowers a keyboard's production cost. Now that we know how it works, let's repair the keyboard. After drying it to the best of my ability, I began by flipping my keyboard upside down and carefully removing its rubber standoffs and sticker located in the center of the backplate. I next removed the battery cover and used a screwdriver to undo the 10 tiny Phillips head screws holding everything together. I then ran a flathead screwdriver along the keyboard's center seam to separate its top plate and back plate. Once done, I flipped the keyboard over and carefully folded over the top plate, making sure not to damage the small ribbon cable that connects the keyboard's trackpad to its main circuit board. I next carefully lifted the latch holding the ribbon cable in place and gently pulled it out of the trackpad connector. This separated the keyboard into two parts. With the top plate off, I first removed the rubber membrane located in the bottom half of the keyboard. This exposed the key matrix circuitry, which is composed of a top sheet, an insulating middle sheet, and a bottom sheet. The next step was to carefully slide the top sheet out of the connector located on the keyboard PCB, which allowed me to remove it from the keyboard. I then also removed the insulating middle sheet and put it aside. To find out where the keyboard traces were interrupted, I used a multimeter set to continuity mode. In this mode, the multimeter sends a small 1 milliamp current through its positive voltage probe and displays the voltage drop between the two probes on its output screen. Using Ohm's law, which states that the current flowing between two points is directly proportional to the voltage across the two points, it is possible for the multimeter to calculate the associated resistance between the two probes. If the resistance between the two probes is less than 70 ohms, a very small value, the multimeter beeps to indicate electrical conductivity between the two points. In cases where the circuit is interrupted, like in a broken trace on a keyboard, the electrical resistance between the two points is infinite. Therefore, it's possible to identify where the keyboard circuitry needs to be fixed by seeing where the multimeter does not produce a beep. I placed the multimeter's common probe at the end point of each trace on the key matrix sheet and walked the positive voltage probe along each trace, listening for a beep. One thing to note is that resistance is also proportional to the length of a trace. The longer the trace, the higher the resistance, meaning that a non-beeping multimeter does not necessarily indicate a broken trace. As such, I needed to sometimes reposition the multimeter's common probe while I tested the traces to verify that the electrical circuit was actually interrupted. Once I had found all of the broken traces, it was time to repair the keyboard using conductive paint. For this, I squeezed a small amount of paint onto a piece of paper, and then used a toothpick to draw a small amount of it over the broken traces on the keyboard. I then let everything dry for three hours. Once the paint was set, I replaced the keyboard's insulating middle sheet and top sheet, reinserted the top sheet into the keyboard PCB's connector, replaced the rubber membrane, and reinserted the ribbon into the keyboard's trackpad PCB. 
I then replaced all of the screws and reinserted the battery cover. The final step was to test the keyboard by trying to head to my favorite website. With a few minutes of work, the keyboard was as good as new and able to type the letter O to my heart's content, ready for unlimited couch surfing and continued use in my Raspberry Pi projects. While not strictly necessary to repair broken traces, I found that conductive paint was the easiest and longest lasting way to repair the keyboard. Since the sheets that make up the key matrix are plastic, it wasn't possible to solder anything to the circuits because it would have melted. I also found that the electrical resistance of the adhesive on the back of copper tape was too high, and that taping aluminum foil over the traces also didn't work because they would lose contact over time. I've also read that pencil graphite can be used to repair circuit board traces, but I didn't have any luck with this method. However, that's not to say that conductive paint is the only way to repair a keyboard. If you know of another way to repair circuit board traces, or have any other cool DIY tricks that you'd like to share, please post them in the comments below. Also, if you enjoyed this video and found it useful, please let me know by giving the video a thumbs up and sharing it with your friends. Thanks again for watching, and good luck with your keyboard repair, but in the meantime, let's go super make something. Thanks for watching! If you enjoyed this video, please be sure to hit the like button and share it with your friends. Your support helps me make more episodes. Links to all project files can be found in the video description below. Click the subscribe button on the left to keep up with my latest projects, click the cards on the right to check out more episodes, and connect with me on social media. Thanks again for watching! Now go super make something!